Hamilton is the Julius Caesar of the modern day. It got a country fired up about history. It's a brilliant work of art, and sometimes it puts iambic pentameter above historical accuracy. And there's a million things I haven't done. Before we dig into this video, just so you know, this isn't going to be a cinema sin style list of, well, actually, rap and hip hop weren't really a thing until the 20th century, so it's extremely unlikely that George Washington would have rapped. Or, wait, why do those women keep the same fashion silhouette through several decades despite being well to do? There are other YouTubers who could do that and better. Nope, this is for everyone else out there who left Hamilton thinking, that was amazing, but how much of it really happened? Even if you've read all 800-some pages of the biography that inspired the musical, there are some parts of Hamilton's life that you might not know. Or, hey, maybe you do. I'm not a historian. If you've got any tidbits or corrections, please drop them in the comments. Trigger warning for some human rights violations coming up in the slavery section. Don't say I didn't warn you. 1. Hamilton wasn't proud of his heritage. Sorry, Lynn. Hamilton might be the most emblematically hip-hoppy rags to riches founding father, but he wasn't open about his past when he was alive. A wealthy background was a requirement for a politician. 2. Heck, he was probably even lying about his age when he got to NYC in order to get into college. When he sailed into New York, he claimed to be 15, but may have been a couple years older. 3. Hamilton's mom wasn't exactly a, wait, I want to stay monetized, a lady of the night. She wasn't particularly monogamous, and the marriage laws at the time made her unable to divorce her first husband once they separated. This did, as the musical claims, make Alexander illegitimate. 4. You might have left the musical assuming that Hamilton was a single child with no parents. Not true. He grew up with a brother-in-law and had a living but estranged father, both of whom he tried to keep in contact with as an adult. 5. Based on the musical, Burr's life was over the moment he shot Hamilton. He's the one who survived, but he paid for it. Little did we know, Burr's life only got more exciting after Alexander's death. It's too much for me to include in this video. A vice president on the run from the law, corrupt land holdings, trial, war with Spain, Jefferson out for blood, taking over Mexico, scamming widows, going to court Alex Hamilton Jr. All this and more in the sequel musical Hamilton Jr. Burr's Revenge. 6. Burr's own legacy child, Theodosia, was lost at sea, making her blown away by a storm just as Philip was blown away by a gun. Oof. 7. Haven't heard of Hercules Mulligan before the musical? There's a good reason. He's pretty obscure, but the name was too good for Lynn to pass up. Via Hamilton the Revolution. Listen, Mulligan didn't grow up to be a statesman like Lafayette or Hamilton, but his name is just the best rapper moniker I ever heard in my life, so he gets the most fun punchlines. 8. The American Revolution wasn't originally against King George. The colonies thought that George would be on their side against the discriminatory practices of Parliament. They were wrong. 9. No, Hamilton probably did not have a tomcat named after him. 10. Angelica didn't marry for practicality's sake. She went against her father's wishes, forcing her to elope. 11. Angelica's father did have a son, named Philip. 12. The idea of Yorktown ending the war is a historical myth. In the live musical only scene of Alexander receiving news of Lawrence's death, it claimed that he died for no reason in a war that had already ended, but that's not an accurate timeline to use. 13. Was Burr actually a better lawyer than Hamilton? It's hard to tell. Somebody made a dramatic murder accusation in court that was remembered through the ages for its drama, where the lawyer held a candle beneath the suspect's face and proclaimed, Behold the murderer, gentlemen! But accounts differ on whether this lawyer was Burr or Hamilton. 14. It's historically only possible that Hamilton could have asked Burr for help on the Federalist Papers. Not a real event. It's an artistic embellishment. 15. Hamilton talked for six hours, but his audience wasn't just listless because of his passion. They were listless because he endorsed a constitutional monarchy, probably omitted for being notoriously unpatriotic. Quote, Mr. Hamilton had been charged with holding an opinion in favor of monarchy, and it had been said he proposed a monarchy to the convention. 16. Hamilton's relationship with Washington was often antagonistic. They did good work together, and the Washington Address portion of the musical was accurate, but the relationship was not as warm as was portrayed. In fact, Hamilton broke up with Washington over something apparently petty. 
When Alexander ran late for a meeting, he found Washington on top of a staircase frowning at him and scolding him for being disrespectful. Alexander decided on the spot to quit his job. In letters, he insisted that three years past, I have felt no friendship for him and have professed none. The two made up eventually, but the musical skips past this fight in favor of keeping both of the men sympathetic. Seventeen. Washington's not yet is justifying such an insidious attitude in American politics towards slavery. From Hamilton the Revolution, Washington, of course, owned hundreds of slaves and did not emancipate them until his death at the end of the century. Eighteen. Speaking of glossing over racism, the Sally Hemings thing. Sally was a teenager and technically a free woman in France, but was manipulated into coming back to America. Her children by Jefferson were only freed after Jefferson's death, and Sally herself was never a free woman. The scandal of Jefferson's concubine made the headlines in 1802. Side note, if we're talking about Jefferson, we all know he bribed slaves for profit, right? I had to get 546 pages into Thomas Jefferson, The Art of Power to find out. He calculated he was getting a 4% increase in capital assets per year on the births of black children and used slave breeding to get credit to build his mansion. 19. Are we still talking slavery? Hamilton was like technically against slavery but still took advantage of it due to his wife's place of privilege since the scholars were slaveholders. This is in contrast to John Adams' extreme human rights positions. 20. The Chernow biography does claim Lawrence and Hamilton as strong abolitionists, but their political stances tended to be based on property rights and practical considerations for padding out the army rather than a belief in equality. 21. Hamilton's had many children that just didn't make the cut for the musical. During a post-show Ham for Ham special, the musical hosted the stories of the other Hamilton children in Sound of Music parody form. In real life, historians will know that Hamilton and Eliza had eight children. Good. 22. Say no to this is just plain old apologetics, putting Hamilton in a position of unwilling victim to the Reynolds' sexy wiles. Not a lot of evidence for this, and it really is up for debate if Mariah knew about her husband's plans, but Hamilton's reactions aren't so much guilty about infidelity as James is such a pain in my butt. And for good reason for the latter, like most of the Reynolds pamphlet is about James Reynolds' harassment of Hamilton. 23. One Last Time loses its context as a political job that encourages American isolationism. 24. We Know was not actually a dynamic trio of Jefferson, Madison, and Burr. Instead, the three characters were James Monroe, Abraham Venable, and Frederick Muhlenberg. It's not hard to see why Lynn wanted to change this for the sake of the narrative. 25. For this reason, Hamilton also challenged Monroe to a duel. Monroe chose Burr as his second, but no shots were actually fired. 26. Burr also challenged Angelica's husband to a duel. 27. The musical skips Philip's awkward, polite exchanges with George Eaker, as well as the first duel between Eaker and Philip's friend. No one was hurt in this duel, which was the norm. 28. Is there discourse about whether Hamilton really threw away his shot? Of course. He definitely claimed to have thrown the shot intentionally, but it may easily have been a misfire. According to Van Ness, as to the pretense that Hamilton did not intend to fire and that Burr knew it, it is more dishonorable to the deceased than the survivor. What do you think of the musical? Historical revisionism or teaching tool? Any corrections or quibbles? Please leave them in the comments below. Smell you later.